Hello, Basu this side. Please do like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And today we have a very eminent personality and we're starting a new segment called Time Out with Basu. And uh, this person comes from New Zealand. He's a two-time Olympian and he's taken part in six world championship. He has scotched many tracks in the world and he has a personal best of 10.17 for the 100 meters and 20.42 for the 200 meters. He is the son of a very famous film director, Roger Donaldson. And I can go on and on and on till the cows come back home about this particular guy. And I always have a fetish for sprinters. And in this pilot episode, we have Chris Donaldson from New Zealand, who's also the head strength and conditioning coach of the national cricket team, New Zealand national cricket team, and a dear friend of mine. And it is a pleasure and honor to have you here, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, Basu. It's a pleasure to be with you and, and talk some uh, track, so to speak. Uh, Chris, before uh, I put you on the sort of a firing line, can you give a short bio about yourself and uh, our fans and followers will be very interested to listen to that. Um, so I guess I sort of, um, if we go back a few years after when my sort of track uh, career was starting to come to an end, I sort of was looking for you know what what next and and i love sport and i loved all sport um so i uh, was fortunate enough just to be at the right time right place and i got an opportunity to train some athletes in what in new zealand are called high performance sport new zealand which is the entity that looks after all the olympic sports and and sort of funds them so um and you know i did that for three or four years uh and was able to you know coach and help train all a range of athletes from, you know, from equestrian to synchronized swimming to rally driving to you name it, I sort of did it. Um, netball, athletics, and um, yeah, it was a really good opportunity just to explore where I wanted to head in, in, in my career. And uh, Chris, I mean, I read up about your bobsled also. I mean, how did that happen? Oh, I forgot about that. Um, so sort of near the end of my athletic career as well, I was looking for new opportunities and um, this opportunity came up to uh, trial for a New Zealand bobsleigh team and they were trying to get the four fastest athletes in the country to put together a bobsleigh team and then the idea was to try and represent New Zealand at the Winter Olympics and uh, you know to me to do a double Olympian which hadn't been done in New Zealand in winter and summer was something that I, I sort of appealed to me. Um, so I did that for two years. We, got, we went to the World Champs which was the qualifying period for the Olympics but we sadly crashed out and uh, didn't quite reach that stage but god it was a it was an amazing experience to to travel the world and do in a winter sport of of that caliber well, it's a fabulous achievement and uh, I mean was it the four sprinters 400 meters relay uh, squad or something in the bobsled <laughs> it, was, it was pretty much like that it was terrifying the first time I went down I've never been so terrified in my life but um, I learned to sort of relax and, and enjoy it. and wow trying to warm up in minus 25 Oh when, when I was used to warming up in 30 degrees, uh, it was an interesting an interesting uh, thing to experience. But yeah, no, I, I look back fondly on that and it's just one of those things that you just try and I, and I loved it. Uh, me coming from Chennai, I'll never understand that ice and that sport. <laughs> <laughs> no, you won't, you won't, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll get into the question segment. I mean, I've lined up a few questions and uh, some of my trainers were also very keen in putting up some questions and uh, sort of jotted it down. Uh, sure. First question is, I mean, apart from you being a great sprinter, your transition into becoming a strength and conditioning coach, and what was your main technical uh, skill set which helped you to become what you are today? Um, yeah, I, I've looked back upon this, and, and what I was very fortunate to do was I was in track and field. I was in the movement-based sport, which was the fundamentals of all sort of sport, running, jumping, throwing. Um, so you spend day in and day out experiencing these types of movements, watching them, learning them. Um, and the other thing which went with sprinting was the Olympic lifting side of things. So you're experiencing, you know, the ability to move objects in, in the, technically, the technical way. Um, also, you know, the plyometrics side of things, which comes with the power and expression of power and force and learning to apply it and cope with it. So, you know, I was very fortunate to get a skill set over 20 years that taught me a lot of these things. Um, and, you know, I was very practical based and still am. Um, so I was, uh, you know, this, this led me to where I am today, but also I had some fantastic mentors. I had um, my sprint coach who taught me, you know, pretty much all the things I, 
that I do now. Um, and I had an SNC guy uh, who was a mentor of mine, still is, is, is exceptional. Um, so I, I was very fortunate just to have a group of people around me that that taught me how to deal with relationships, create relationships, as well as the the fundamentals of of what we do in SNC. Fantastic, I man. I mean, I totally understand where you're coming from, and uh, you have so many reference points, and that comes in handy while coaching. Yeah, for sure. You know, when you're dealing with speed and force and power, it's the hardest thing to change. Um, because you know, if everyone could change speed and power, then then everyone would be fast, wouldn't they? So, but you're also dealing with the the um, over the, the injury side of things as well. So I was injured a lot. <laughs> I tore my hamstrings and I tore everything. So I learned how to rehab, go through the whole process of getting back to being able to function at 100%. So you know, I, I, I had another element to the to the side of um, my athletics career that really helped me going forward was understanding that side of things, injuries and how that works from not only the rehab but also the mental side of things. So you would recommend young SNCs to give a shot in track and field? <laughs> I would definitely see, get involved, learn it, understand it, watch it, practically maybe even try it, try bits and pieces. You don't have to be a 10-1 runner. You can be 15-1, but you can enjoy it just as much. I mean, I when I grew up and I had a training group, which was you know five or six people that I used to work with, and, and we they had trained just as hard as me. None of them were gonna to go to Olympics. None of them were even gonna be good enough to maybe win a national title, but they trained every day just as hard as I did. Um, so they understood the levels that go into it. And um, yeah, and, and I think that's one of my biggest um, pieces of advice is try it, experience it, see what it feels like, see what it feels like on your body so you can understand what an athlete's gonna go through. So find the cohort, get into it, and get your hands dirty. The message from Scott. Yep, that's exactly it. Okay, skills aside, uh, Chris, uh, there are so many other things which is required in life to become successful. And Chris Donaldson today is a successful man. He's been in the, at the top of his things at New Zealand cricket, and you're apparently New Zealand cricket team has come to the tops now. And uh, what is your secret sauce? for success, apart from the domain expertise? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, it's it's all relative, I guess. It's the understanding of the players and, and creating relationships. I think it all just blends back into that relationship with the athlete. They're not going to trust you or understand what you're trying to achieve with them if you don't create the relationship. So um, I think that for a small country like New Zealand, it's a lot easier for me to create relationships with our group. Um, and we've been together a long time. Um, they understand what I'm trying to achieve and I make sure they understand what I'm trying to achieve with them so that they can they can understand why they're doing the program, what's the outcome and how does it relate back to their cricket because it's that's the most important part is the cricket. You know, I could make them a 9.9 .9 runner or a 20.4 <laughs> but if they can't catch a cricket ball, who cares? So, so there is an element of it all relates back to what they do um, and, and that's where the friendship side of things and you've got to enjoy yourself you have to enjoy people and enjoy that conversation and the, and the camaraderie that you get and and I really love that and um, you know I've been fortunate this year to go well last year sorry to do the IPL and and that was a real eye-opener for me um, and again I loved it I loved interacting with the group new players and hopefully they enjoyed it as well yeah you can be fit but you need to be fit for your sport and at the end exactly. of the day, perform and you're a tool to help these athletes or these cricketers to get to their respective goals. Super. Yes. And uh, yeah. if you have to relive your career today as a sprinter and an SNC and you go back in timelines, what do you do? What do you think you do differently? I'd run faster so that I actually I actually did better. But <laughs> but um, I don't know. Uh, it's it's a really interesting question there. Um, you know, because when when I was in my career with athletics, we, we were quite novice. There wasn't the, the the Instagrams went around with all these different training ideas. It was sort of we we worked together as a small group that developed ideas and tried them. Um, you know, even from the gym stuff, I was developing and thinking of ideas because that was something I was passionate about. So I'd think an exercise, an outcome I wanted. So I created an exercise to suit that outcome. Um, and same on the track, you know, where I would, travel the world and see what other app sprinters were doing and take the best of what I thought that would work for me and develop that into my program and try it and see if it made me faster. Um, so, you know, and I also, I guess the mental component comes a long way into that as well, but I really enjoyed that side of things. Um, 
so I guess if I look back, I was a bit of an overtrainer as well. So I tended to do too much. I love the feeling of just wrecking myself. So I just, I tended to do too much and I tended to run too fast when I needed to slow down at times and just rhythm. But uh, that was just, that was just me. Um, and I don't think I would have changed. I could change that to be honest. Um, and then in the SNC career, I, I think my limitations are probably, which, which sometimes I wonder if it's not a limitation. I don't get overwhelmed with all the literature and yeah. research out there, which can be really confusing. So you know, I'm fortunate that a few people sometimes minimize that down for me and give me some of the best stuff that they feel works. So I don't have to just overwhelm myself with the craziest latest stuff because you can get overwhelmed and actually forget the basics because the basics work. Um, and, and it all relates back to the performance outcome. Are they fitter, faster, stronger? Yes, then that's really what matters. So there's a modern trend of a lot of uh, objective data coming into the system. So I mean, I'm sure you say that the subject to is also equally important. And the coach in you can't die, right? Yeah. yeah. For a coach, I mean, you can have all the information in the world, but uh, you need to use your common sense and experience. And uh, that comes uh, at the tops at the end of the day, right? Exactly. It's, it's about doing it, isn't it? It's a GPS is great, the data, but it doesn't make you run faster. It doesn't make you move your legs quicker or it doesn't make you fitter. You've still got to do the work. So yeah, you need to you know, temper the, the outcome to what you want and then use that information to develop your programs. But I don't think sometimes it can come first and you forget the training, but you're so busy trying to get the data that you forget the training. So yeah. So learn the trade and not the loop alone. Okay. <laughs> yep. Prior, pr prioritize what you want to get the outcome. And, and you know, and that's where testing and all those things come into play, which some people sort of forget about is do a program, test it, see if you actually was the outcome you wanted. Did they get whatever you were planning? Yes or no. And then develop it to, from there. So it's actually quite simple. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, if you have to look back as a coach and he says, I had many challenging moments. And if you have seen out one challenging moment in your life, I mean, can you just, just throw some light on that? Um, from a from a personal point of view, um, my biggest challenges were uh, my Achilles injury at the Olympics, um, where I had a chronic inflammation of the tendon, and it took two years. And I and I and I, I was never really the same after that. To be honest, I never was able to run as fast as I used to, um, and that was sort of probably the ending of my career. And and then that led on to understanding that it was coming to an end. Um, it was terrifying. You know, it's terrifying to realize that everything, all my heart and soul that I put into my track and field was coming to an end and, and I didn't have anything else outside of that. Um, and, a, and a lot of athletes go through it. Cricketers, that's a real t terrifying place to be. Um, so from our point of view, you know, we're dealing with this day in and day out as well when you're an SSC coach because you see them the most out of probably everybody. You see them more than the coaches. So you, you, you sort of have to be able to create that relationship as well to, to understand the athlete. Um, but they were probably the two biggest terrifying moments in my life was understanding that I wasn't going to get faster and that it was maybe over and, and then accepting that it was over was um, the toughest. Yeah, from, uh, from a track and field. I mean, one... What was that, sorry? It was a difficult time. I had uh, this sort of a situation. One situation that you overcome and how did you do it as a strength and condition? Uh, I think coming off the... For us as a New Zealand team was coming off their second World Cup final against England and that loss um, really affected the team emotionally and then we had a series coming up um, two or three weeks after the World Cup final in Sri Lanka and it was how how do you motivate a group that is so devastated to get ready for the next series which is you know just about to take place um, so it was a real interesting dynamic of trying to get them conditioned and preparation for the next series but also giving them time to for want of a better word grieve of what just had happened, because <laughs> it's nearly worse than than losing by a hundred is drawing it and then losing. So um, I think that was a really interesting dynamic where the group was, and, and even for the support staff, because we put a heart and soul into everything. And yeah. and you know you you're well versed in this, bus, so you've you've experienced the highs of winning many times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we hadn't won it before, so yeah, it was it was an interesting time. I mean, a uh, couple of technical questions, Chris. Uh, I mean, energy systems is a question which all young SNCs ask me. 
Uh, one is the ATP, CP, lactic acid, and the long energy mm. system. I mean, how do you sort of uh, mix and match uh, to meet the requirements of a sport? And what is a simple uh, sort of uh, approach you have? And how do you go about it? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I probably don't get down to the actual, to the, to the levels of the energy system itself and the programming that I do, but I use I thought the programming that's... Yeah, yeah, use the programming in a, in a way to get the outcomes that affect those energy systems, if that makes sense. So, so speed in itself, I do pure speed, which is totally different to speed endurance. People sort of get confused, I think, with the names. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, and speed itself, pure speed is big rest, short distance, and full noise, hundred percent. And there's a technical, a huge technical element to it because you break it into two parts, don't you? You've got acceleration, well, three acceleration transition phase. And then the up and running so you've got three phases within sprinting that you're trying to deal with um and you know the other thing with with that sort of thing with speed in itself is the accelerations the acceleration phase is such a great phase to teach because it teaches lateral jumping it keeps it's a power movement that is relates to vertical and horizontal force application um so you know if you can prove that usually everything else will go up anyway um, so there's that sort of that that where you're dealing with it in the programming sense around the energy systems, and then obviously you're dealing with the aerobic component and then um, speed endurance. So there's that's probably the way I deal with how I cope with the energy systems. I, I relate it back to to what I'm trying to achieve with the the programming on aerobic um, speed endurance and speed pure speed, and then obviously I've got the, the component of even um, uh, I use circuits. And, and other things as well to get offloaded type type mechanisms that will will improve the athlete and get their work ethic and their work rate higher so they're used to working at a high rate which is cricket stinking hot conditions six hours in the field five day test you need to be fit and, and we remember in New Zealand we don't have the conditions I think you guys have I mean I've heard a couple of uh, training programs and uh, I heard that you do a little bit of speed endurance work with the fast bowlers too. I mean, what sort of uh, speed endurance programs uh, will you sort of recommend for young fast bowlers? And somebody wants to get fitter, and obviously they need to run well and need to be robust, resilient uh, to last their careers or last the season and stuff like that. So, what will be your one what go to workout and say oh, this is a killer and this is going to sort of benefit you in a big way? Look, I think, you know, with speed endurance, I, I, I take it back to a lot of my track and field stuff as well. So the speed endurance I do is, is based around that um, high top end um, work rate with, uh, with rest. So for instance, one session that I run with the boys is you run a 200 meters as fast as you can, which may be 26, 27, 28 seconds, whatever it is for the athlete. They have one minute to walk, run, to get back to the start of the 100 meters, and then they've got a flat out 100. And that's timed. And then you have four to five minutes rest and you might do four or five. The interesting part is that in track, I would give them more volume because in, sorry, in, um, in cricket, I'd give them more volume because they can't express as much pace and force as say a sprinter. And because I, I used to do this session myself and I'd do three or four reps and I was completely wrecked, like possibly vomiting. But in cricket, I would do four. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so a cricketer wouldn't be able to express that type of speed. You know, I'd be running 20 second, rolling 20 seconds or 19 for the two inches where they'd run 28, 29. Um, but, and then they'll do four or five of those. And it is, it is horrific because you're dealing with huge lactic. So the lactic load is so high um, that you're teaching your body to cope when you're hitting those high intensity. So what happens with that, in my eyes, this is obviously my opinion, is um, the higher the intensity and the better you get at, at coping and replicating high intensity movements, everything else becomes easy below it. So your aerobic system gets so much easier because you become more efficient at just operating. And then ironically, all our yo-yos went through the roof when they got better at that stuff, rather than they just did aerobic slow running. So if you run slow, you will be slow. It's as simple as that really. So, yeah. yeah. So, so that's how, you know, there's one session, which is a speed endurance session or, um, even you can just, it's all around. Uh, there's another one I do where I give them goals for the hundreds and 200s, and they run 450s as sort of a warm up, walk back. They've got four 100s under, say, 14 seconds, 
walk back, and then they've got two twos under 26 seconds. Big rest, do it again. But they've got quite big rests, um, and that's horrific. But giving them goals that they can achieve gives them an idea to try and beat. And then the goals each week get a little bit quicker as you adapt and get faster. So, I mean, it's it's just, you know, it's there's so many op options. I mean, these are just a couple of sessions that I use. There's so many different vari variations that are possible. I mean, I'm sure as a sprinter and as a coach, you must have used uh, plyometrics and uh, Olympic weightlifting a great deal. And uh, I mean, I, mean we, I guess we all uh, go in that direction a lot. And uh, is there a particular sort of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, um, say I would say confirmation bias towards plyometrics or weightlifting or a recent match sport. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, over the years, I've sort of changed and developed the lifting and the, the plyometric work. So I sort of have combinations of plyometric work. So for instance, I, I may use at the start of the program steer plyometrics. So we're jumping up and doing continuous, it's more sort of, and what that does is it deloads the body on landing because you're not getting the full impact of, because you're jumping up onto something, but you've got the continuous bounding ability to go forward. So I, I use sometimes stairs as a, as a, as a starting piece for plyometric work. Um, you know, I, I'm quite a fan of more vertical than horizontal plyometrics mm -hmm. for, for cricketers and track people and things like that, because that's the plane you work on a lot more. Um, and I think it relates, you, you usually it'll relate a bit better to running fast and things anyway, but you, your horizontal is going to go up anyway, probably anyway. So, so why not? That's, that's my own sort of generalized stuff. Um, and I guess if you're doing a lot of sprinting and high end stuff, you're getting a lot of plyometric through, through that as well. So you've got to be careful overloading stuff with that. Uh, but again, that's where you use things like box jumping and stuff to deload the body when you land. So it's the landing impact that you can you can manipulate to fit um, what you're after, um, and you know things like that. Uh, what else do I use? Three double foot bouncer distance and things like that. You know, single leg hopping, landing, all that sort of thing that that helps you apply force and cope with force. Um, because I think in cricket, and you, and you know this very well, so is that the the biggest thing that'll break you is force, which is fast bowling. So. Force will break you. That's the thing. So, the more you can apply, the more you possibly will be get injured. But the more you can handle, the less injured you might be. So, yeah, fine line, fine line. It's about all. I mean, the handling part, which is the most important thing, and uh, the fine balance between neural fatigue, power production, force production, and running volume. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, just a few questions on your personal uh, records. Or distances, uh, your best in best over 40 meters. 40 meters, God, we did 30s actually. We did oh. a lot of 30 meter stuff. Um, and uh, mine was about, I think, 3.32. Yeah. <laughs> That's quick. Yeah. Your best, yeah. Over yeah. Well, meters. My best, what sorry, 120 meters. Oh, God. Oh, that's a that's taking it back. That's it's we did a lot of rolling stuff, so it's not from a standing start, but it was under 12 from, from memory. God, we're, talking, we're going back a long way. <laughs> and uh, your PR over 300 meters? Uh, I ran 30 point something rolling, I think it was, or yeah, 30.1 or 30 point. You played your 140 meters anytime this? I, I ran one when I was 15, I think it was like 48.1 or something when I was 15 or 16. I, I, I was terrified of them. They Same hurt so much. <laughs> <laughs> you never make the meters for the red lining. <laughs> <laughs> on the base of my of my oh. calendar, you're so pooped and gone and everything. <laughs> you want to puke, you want to poop, you want to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> I actually remember my my very first 400. I was 13 or 14, and there was a nationals run New Zealand New Zealand nationals, and they said, "Can you come down and run the senior men's four by four because we don't have enough runners for where I live." Yeah. so which is a targo and um i said sure so i came down and they put me last so this is senior men this is this is the big uh, everyone's like 25 years old and i'm 13 i got the bat team wasn't very good i got the bat last uh -huh. and i had passed everybody within the first 100 meters i was so excited and uh -huh. i could hear the crowd going crazy uh -huh. and i got to the 200 meter i got to the 200 meter mark and the wheels fell off so badly uh -huh. that i could hear the, i could hear the crowd go ooh. And I just and I came last. I came last by miles, but God, I was sick. It was so sick. Man, I remember my first hundred. 
just like you in the first 200 meters i just caught the track and i was <laughs> away from everyone i was feeling the path and by the time i reached the home stretch i was so gone and i was so gone and i could feel the crouching and i finished last and I, the first one was something like 22 3 or something so when i finished the first it's like i said that i'll never do the four minute i think <laughs> a couple more uh, sort of events in the 400 meters and then after that i said 400 meters is not for me then yeah. <laughs> too much of red lining and lactic acid is not for me <laughs> oh, i i do agree i do agree yeah and uh, i mean i mean i just want you to give your take i mean if a young snc if they have to look in a particular direction uh, i mean what are the three they should be barking on what resources should you be asking them to look at Look, I think, and I've said this to a few young SNCs trying to get into the industry, is look, you need to immerse yourself in as many sports as you can. You need to, and a lot of hard work is required and you're not going to get paid initially and you're going to have to just intern anything. Just take on the opportunity, learn, understand, get involved, see how it works, follow along. And what you'll find is that at times, teams will go, oh, we need someone or we need an intern or we need something. and they all think of you because you keep volunteering or trying to help um you know and I, and it's a tough industry to get into i mean both of us are incredibly fortunate we've been given the opportunities to do what we do um mine was by fluke but i managed to get there anyway and and, and i i mean it is it is a wonderful wonderful job and you get to deal with some people but you have to like people you have to be willing to learn and adapt and get and there's going to be players and and athletes that do not want to do what you do what you want to do so you've got to learn how to adapt and and help them to understand what they need but um i think the relationship piece enjoyment and just immerse yourself in everything especially the practical element i think can go missing because you because it's quite different than from the books from the learning in a book it's quite different when you actually have to experience it practically um and you know when you're in in something like that okay, um you there's so many variables with accommodation where you are hotels gym equipment you've got so many things you're not going to have so you've got to work around the around the, you know work it out you've got to adapt and that's what is you know learn to adapt and fast i mean got to communicate you need to be a practitioner and you need to be a people's person yep. with the domain yep. knowledge well said chris <laughs> yeah um, yep. la- last question i'll keep it uh, sure. last question and uh, a lot of essences they travel 10 years up 11 years up somewhere they see the man in the mirror they are stuck in the same place and they feel that they have not moved much ahead so mm-hmm. what is your piece of advice for them yeah i think you know after 10 11 years you probably found your your niche and your philosophy on the way you train but you can get stuck with um limiting yourself to the same stuff constantly so how you go about learning and bringing in new stuff without throwing out the baby with the bathwater so to speak um and and learning how to introduce certain things and stimuluses and different equipment or different programming ideas and things without just throwing everything else that you've learned so for instance um example is recently over the last couple of years my programming has changed in the aspect of instead of doing significant blocks of eccentric isometric whatever it is strength i actually go week on week off through a program so i might go eccentric isometric strength eccentric isometric and i've and still the same exercises and everything but just a different way of stimulating the body and adapting it and it's worked really well it's a major gain so you know with the boys so yeah so it was undulating and under, through different so, and, and and if you read the book they kind of don't go down that road they kind of say do a centric thing you do your isometric but <laughs> yeah be willing to just try it what's the worst can happen as long as you don't injure the athlete that's the main thing yeah you can't be stuck with uh, textbook knowledge all your life you need to be a practitioner not all your life no i just think you need to be a practical absolutely i mean roger i mean one question out of the sort of <laughs> the usual fitness thing i mean you grew up in a house where your father was a famous film director so can we expect a film from chris donson in the future <laughs> I think my acting <laughs> my acting is that poor. It's never going to it's never going to be in front of the camera, I tell you that. It's always going to be if anything behind it, but no, I I think I'm going to leave that to dad. dad. <laughs> I think dad would agree that agree that I leave it to him as well. 
Chris, uh, it was a pleasure having you. It was absolute pleasure, and uh, me hosting you in this pilot episode is uh, a sort of a dream come true. And uh, I mean, I always have a fetish for sprinters, and uh, the guy who's run ten point one four. I mean, I can't ask for better. And uh, I mean, your career with New Zealand cricket team is very well documented, <laughs> and everybody has seen. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we'll be. Uh, transferring this whole thing into our podcast too i mean uh, it's an absolute pleasure and no thank you thanks a ton all the best i love talking about it. thank you so much basu thank you thank you